look around the world, there's one really strong growth center, and that is China. Uh, whichever industry you're in, you know, certainly in Europe, we're struggling. Whereas China is still moving ahead. Um, but it's not just about the market itself. There's actually the whole movement of innovation is moving towards China. Uh, the Chinese are actually succeeding because they're not, they don't actually know what they're not meant to do. They don't know they're trying things in different ways, in new ways. And they're actually developing new processes, new services, new products, which are quite outstanding. Some of those have global markets back in the West. And I think in many of the sectors, that, certainly in the technology sectors, there's very few companies in the West that won't be affected in three to five years by what is happening today in China. So I don't think companies who want to be in business in three to five years can afford to ignore what's happening. How they engage is a different question. Now China is much more innovative across the whole range in different technologies, in different products. Also, what's also very interesting is that quite often by adapting a product for Chinese needs, you actually find the global uh, market. The picture we're seeing is not very rosy. Um, so I don't want to be, um, you know, uh, not being the, uh, the, the mood uh, here. It's, it's just that, uh, yes, you do need a, a China strategy, or uh, more precisely, I would say, you do need to see where China fits in your in your, in your business, in where you're going, uh, either as a competitor, either as an outsourcing um, location, or as a market. Um, but uh, in any case, you have to put China on your map. Yes, over half of our portfolio companies have substantial sales uh, in, in Asia, and in particular in China. But let me start with an anecdote. I was 15 years old, my father came home and said, boy, you're going to learn English. I said, okay, but in those days he said, okay, father. He said, well, but why? And his answer was, English is the most important language in the world. You're going to learn English. And that's how I ended up in Cambridge. When my kids were 15 years old, I told them that story about my father. And I said, in my opinion, Chinese is the most important language now. And I will do to you what my father did when I was 15 years old. Go and um, you know, learn, learn Chinese. Go to Beijing and Shanghai for the summer. It was always the summer. I was in school in Austria. And they did. I was going to many companies and the arms story in China later on. Oh, no, go ahead. I, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Well, uh, <laughs> ARM is, um, well, it's just become uh, the first Cambridge company to be worth uh, $20 billion. It's uh, my most successful company, uh, you know, financially. Uh, it's got some, you know, staggering results now. We, we sold uh, uh, 9 billion arms last year. That's more microprocessors than uh, people on Earth. Uh, it's also more microprocessors than Intel has sold it in its, in its entire history. Um, and since 2010, the value of the arms that we collect, the royalty on Willow Wills, the most successful uh, IP company, but the value of the arm chips has now overtaken Intel sales. So even in uh, dollar terms, uh, you know, that's over $40 billion, even in dollar terms, arm is now more um, successful architecture than the Intel architecture, but we were really worried about China. Because we went, and this was Robin Saxby, uh, who, who ran ARM for, uh, for through, throughout its fantastic growth period. We've been very lucky to have um, uh, Robin as the CEO. And he went to all the different Chinese universities. And of course, every university thought they had to do a Chinese microprocessor. So all the professors there were working on their Chinese ARM. So they were getting very worried. They said, what are we going to be able to do about China? This is, we're going to lose one of the greatest growth markets in the world. So he thought about this very carefully and then said, why don't we ask, why don't we go talk to these Chinese professors and say, look, you can do your own microprocessor, of course you can, but here is some money to translate our manuals for you and, and we, we will pay you to run an ARM course because if your students know how to design an ARM uh, with, into a bigger uh, solution, then you immediately have a solution that you can sell rather than having to wait until the Chinese microprocessors on the market. And so, with the result of that, there are now 200 books written by 200 different Chinese professors on the arm. So, this became the standard uh, book in Chinese universities when you wanted to know about microprocessors. And uh, we ended up with a 98% market share in mobile phones, which is. <laughs> <laughs> The Chinese market is dominated by Android. Uh, so even if, if tomorrow Apple 
is coming back with more product is going to be very challenging. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is not only price, is also the openness of the system and the ecosystem that has built around Android. Uh, and uh, Google has made many mistakes in China, but this one they didn't make. Um, and uh, they were uh, actually strong enough to actually uh, uh, have their system adapted by uh, many, many companies such as uh, uh, Baidu, uh, Alibaba, and, uh, and, and so on, so that everybody now, and uh, also Xiaomi has their own uh, version of Android uh, to uh, popularize the platform. Uh, and because the system is very open, you can sideload applications uh, much better. Sideload applications, sideload uh, songs, videos, uh, completely differently than you would be doing uh, with an iPhone, uh, which we need to jailbreak to actually uh, do uh, sideloading and uh, and, and to be flexible. So, as far as trends are concerned, um, I would say everything related to uh, mobile internet is very hot. I mean, you've got more than 400 uh, million mobile internet subscribers in China, and this is going to go beyond um, uh, internet subscribers, uh, which is uh, peaking at uh, 400, uh, 546 by uh, or early January this year. So, by mid this year, you're going to see mobile internet subscribers just um, uh, reaching and, and going beyond uh, uh, and, and, and being the majority of, uh, of the internet subscribers in China and, the, and the access to uh, mobile, to content will be done through mobile. So this is a fact of life in emerging markets is that access to content now is being done through mobile. How many has taken the market by storm? But there's a few of them. Uh, a company called Tapas. Tapas is a mobile uh, OS, but it's more UI. It's a user interface on top of uh, Android. Uh, that is, you know, the rumor says being sold to Baidu for a humongous uh, amount of money. So, and that company is not even two years old. Uh, so, uh, we can go into each vertical uh, separately. Personally, um, I like mobile. I think it's also very, uh, very tricky because it's very, very local. You need to be, uh, you need to have a hundred percent local team to do mobile, in my opinion. Because I have done mobile, I have done it successfully. I'm not sure I will do it successfully again. So, uh, and because I see so many mobile companies started by, uh, uh, by foreigners for a lot of different reasons are not succeeding and, and um, mobile is a, is a tricky animal and so is the internet in general in China. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, I see uh, travel as being a, uh, a stable uh, source of growth for the, uh, uh, for the market. That would be offline travel, online travel, everything related to travel is uh, something I, I like. Also the fact that it's completely dematerialized, uh, you will never get me again to invest in an e-commerce company. That's for sure. Uh, 360 buy. I mean, you know they just raised 700 million uh, from uh, I think Saudis and, and other investors. Um, but it's just because they can't list. And uh, it's, you know, I think I've total, I've counted, they probably, uh, they probably raised two, two and a half billion US in our, the, the life of the company. So that means it's an exit without an exit. I mean, it's an exit that doesn't, doesn't say its name. Uh, but they, they're not making, they're not profitable yet. And uh, they are really far away from, uh, from uh, Alibaba, Taobao, uh, Tmall, as far as the uh, mobile, uh, as far as e-commerce is concerned. So uh, uh, I would say e-commerce e is a tricky animal, but um, uh, travel, uh, advertising, location-based services, uh, and social networking in general, uh, are good areas to be uh, to be focusing on. What about uh, social commerce? Or is that already over? Way over. Recommendations. Um, uh, talk, well, the, the problem is you have uh, social media is dominated by a few players, uh, like WeChat from uh, Tencent, uh, Weibo from uh, well Tencent, Weibo, and Sina Weibo, but the biggest is Sina Weibo, uh, and a few others like Ren Ren and other people. So. Uh, social commerce is just a subset of that industry. So if some of these big players are moving in, uh, you'd better be incubated by them in order to be successful. And uh, there aren't that many places to be uh, to be doing this. You're either incubated by, uh, I would say, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, and a few other, and uh, of course, Innovation Works, to be part of the, the club. If you're not part of the club, it's extremely difficult to raise financing uh, and after to get exits and full on round, uh, rounds. Uh, 
in, in, in social commerce. It is a good area, it's just that uh, e-commerce in general is very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to be profitable. And uh, and social, you have social networks that are dominating the market. So then you'd better be an API on top of a social network, uh, providing co uh, commerce applications and having a, a let's say, defensible uh, barriers to entry with your business model. Uh, and uh, I would say that that could be uh, that could be a good uh, good place to fit. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of big players in in, in that space, and you you got to be to make sure that you you fit right in. And they're not going to eat your lunch uh, after a few months, and that that happened over and over. So, uh, as an as an entry investor, uh, I can tell you my due diligence is longer and longer because the longer I wait, the longer I can see the competitors just moving in slowly but surely, and um, then I'm asking again the entrepreneur. I say, "Are you sure you're the only one doing this?" And I say, "Yeah, sure. You guys are a small player." Well, what about Taobao? Oh no 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 it's alright. But then, then you can see that Taba is, is doing things that they're also doing. Or Tencent uh, moving or providing features that the whole company is actually based on. <laughs> and their value proposition is uh, I provide you Instagramming kind of uh, application or e-commerce and then recommendation on the you know food spotting. And then uh, it's so easy if the, the, the moment that uh, WeChat from uh, Tencent is opening API on, on food spotting uh, or uh, APIs in general. Uh, then it's going to be very easy for Tencent themselves to actually provide the service or have some of the companies that they invested in. You know, they inked 1.5 billion just to do investment. I'm not saying that they are savvy investors, but they are investors. Um, and uh, so if they want to invest in one company that they favor uh, to use their APIs on WeChat, which is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the English equivalent of uh, Weixin, uh, the, the, the social, um, social network, 300 million mobile, mobile members now, uh, then it's going to be very easy for them. So my job is getting uh, harder and harder, uh, and uh, so I think trends, the trends that I'm telling you today might be different tomorrow. I'm great attractions of um, the uh, mobile internet and uh, consumer internet in particular is that you can create really a, um, a, a very valuable company in a very short time with very little money, but often also with very little defensibility. So one of the advantages of doing it the old-fashioned way, if you like, uh, to have a deep technology company that has some really uh, a clearly differentiated product. And there are a number of areas uh, which are really getting very interesting, and, and, and you're totally right on the mobile the sector, of course, being now uh, uh, much more attractive than the PC. In fact, uh, you know, we, we, we do live in a, uh, in a post-PC uh, era. In fact, I give a a little talk called the five waves of computing with mainframe, mini computer, workstation, PC, and now uh, the smartphone and the smartphone and steroids called tablets being the main uh, computing environment. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you look at the, if you step back and look at these five waves, there is no case where the leader in one wave becomes a significant player in the next wave. So uh, you know we just had this transition from the PC era to the smartphone and tablet era. Uh, and the amazing thing is that two of the greatest uh, technology companies the Earth has ever seen, Intel and Microsoft, have no position in the mobile market. It is, uh, you know, really rather, uh, rather strange and sort of takes you back to DEC. I mean, DEC was the company in the mini computer area and yet uh, it doesn't exist anymore. So what are the areas where you can, where you can clearly differentiate yourself? Well, one is health. Uh, there are going to be all kinds of uh, interesting add-ons, hardware add-ons to mobile phones about, uh, you know, taking your pulse, your heart rate, your ECG, your glucose levels, uh, your respiration, uh, which, which uh, you know, do need uh, a bit of differentiated hardware. And uh, if, for example, you want to do an ECG, to do a good ECG on a mobile phone, this is hard. Uh, and if you have uh, some patents on how you do it, because uh, there's a clever way of doing, you can differentiate. And you know there might be many differences between Europeans and Americans and uh, and the Chinese, but ECG is not one of them. <laughs> so I think there are great opportunities with a clearly differentiated product with a defensible technology. I think you're right, though, that there are within China there are certain core companies that are becoming very important to certain industries where it's difficult to get past them. But it's the same, you know, it's the same in the US and certain industries. But, but the Chinese also tend to 
like the Japanese and the Koreans before, they over-invested in industries. You know, like the uh, Japanese used to do in consumer electronics. So there's something like 200 car companies in China. But every region, every region wanted to have its own car company. You know, there'll have to be some sort of rationalization or someone will have to disappear, and it may take time. Um, but at the same time also, sometimes you've got to also choose your timing. Because sometimes when the government uh, target a particular technology, like electric vehicles, then people will move very rapidly into those areas. And it's very different for Western companies, but quite often they move in with, that, with the wrong technology and the whole thing fails. And then they step back. And that's the time to go in and try and sort of partner and try and get your technology solution uh, adopted. So it, it's not very easy. It's, um, it, you know, you, you, you've got to choose your time, your, your space, uh, and how you go about it. Well, you're, you're in the solar business. What's the outlook for clean tech in, in China? I mean, there's such a need, right? It, it seems well, like it would be a natural. There was a, at, at one period, there was an enormous growth. I mean, the company I'm chairman of, in five years, our revenues were from $5 billion to over a billion. And I remember just before we listed on the New York Stock Exchange, a Chinese private equity group came to see us. And then after they'd been around and they talked to us and they looked at what we were doing, they said, we're not going to invest. You're not actually ambitious enough. You're not growing fast enough. You know, so it, it's, you know, China is a very different sort of world. But having said that, there's so much investment in, in that sector that there's no point anybody now coming in anew. But there may be uh, technologies around it which are relevant because all these sectors start small, they grow very large, and the larger they become, the more there are subsectors which are big in their own right. You know, so if you're in, 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 in solar modules, well, maybe inverters is the place to be, or certain types of materials which are, you know, protect the, uh, you know, the, the cells. Whatever it is, there are lots of sub-markets which are very big markets in their own right, which are beginning to emerge, where some of the larger companies won't have the technology, and they'd be looking for the best technology around the world. So I think, you know, it, it, it depends on your sector, really. Well, LEDs is a space in China that's getting a lot of government incentives, right? Yeah, but I wouldn't go in the hardware side, because there's so much investment going on, and so many companies now, <coughs> you know, the, the price point is coming down. If you're in something that's a bit more sophisticated, like managing LED systems, or even if you look at whether it's solar or LEDs, the installation, uh, you know, a lot of people have made a lot of money by installing. Uh, you know, all systems integration. So you know, even within a, a sector, there could be opportunities, but you've got to, again, look at the whole value chain, see where you want to be, where it's logical to be, but realize that that's part of the value chain that is attractive today may be very different in the future. I mean, Rene Solar, we're, we're about sort of, what, seven years old? Um, we've changed our business model three times. We've moved into different parts of the value chain, uh, and backwards and forwards, and moved across. You have to be constantly moving and changing. Mm -hmm. So don't think that because you, you see an opportunity today, that in three years' time, that opportunity will still be there. 